friends and fams, it's your boy Migs here with my channel Consciously Metal and today we have a very special video. I just recently saw the last episode of Last Week Tonight and they're pretty much touching upon a subject that I feel has been very widely ignored ever since it started. Uh, this episode was related to a, the next pandemic. Not pretty much talking about this current pandemic but pretty much what could what could happen and what can lead up to going into the next pandemic which could catch us off, off guard at any minute if we continue to go about things like if this pandemic never even happened in the first place and honestly that's the way that it seems to be looking like it's gonna go because uh the the very um the very um origin source of of the virus is practically not even spoken about that much anymore and I think it has to do with the fact that a lot of people have uh, money invested in animal agriculture and honestly that is the number one threat to humanity as it stands animal agriculture not even um, in a vegan activist sense is is very threatening to humanity as a whole because 70% of the antibiotics that are produced in the United States go to animal agriculture and the raising of livestock to prevent them from getting sick and protect animal ag's uh, investments. The fact that they do this overfeeding these animals antibiotics every time that gay is sick and stuff like that is what creates the possibility of a strain of of a virus that can be anti-resistant to can that can be resistant to antibiotics that can be produced and eventually there'll be a virus that comes out of the animal agriculture intensive farming industry that won't be able to be cured with any antibiotics or vaccines that we can produce. So with that note, let's check this out and I'll stop and pause and I'll comment wherever I feel it's necessary, but it's definitely a very good, uh, very good show, very well covered. And uh, let's just get into it. Our main story tonight concerns pandemics. You know, the thing every little virus could one day grow into. Wait, even me? Yeah, maybe even you, mystery virus. Wow, that's great. Thanks for helping me believe in myself, John. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm off to the Mall of America. Whee! <laughs> okay, have fun. I'm probably going to regret that. And I know you might be thinking right now, John, shut the fuck up. No one wants to hear any more about the coronavirus. And I do get that, which is why we're not actually going to talk about the current pandemic tonight. We're going to talk about the next one instead, which I know sounds even less appealing. But look, we are the show we are. If you want to see a British person do something hot or interesting, go watch Bridgerton. A lot of jizzing in blankets on that show. However much you expect, there's significantly more. But now might also be the most important time to talk about this because scientists attempted to warn us about the next pandemic long before the current one hit. And we didn't really listen. In fact, 17 years ago, just after the SARS epidemic was contained, a leading scientist was on 60 Minutes sounding a chilling warning. What worries me the most is that we're going to miss the next emerging disease, that we're going to suddenly find a SARS virus that moves from one part of the planet to another, wiping out people as it moves along. Something more lethal than SARS is what worries you. That's something to be keeping you awake at night. Uh, yeah, it is, because that is a hauntingly spot-on prediction there. I kind of wanted him to continue. Uh, just spitballing here, what if that guy from The Apprentice becomes president? Or some lonely goon at Harvard invents a website that destroys the fabric of society as we know it? That's something to keep you awake at night too. 
Look, I know this current coronavirus might feel like a once-in-a-lifetime nightmare, but it's actually part of a global trend, because the total number of infectious disease outbreaks has increased significantly since 1980. We've seen outbreaks like SARS in 2003, H1N1 in 2009, a series of Ebola outbreaks, most notably in 2014, MERS in 2015, Zika that same year, and of course, the current virus that we're all enduring, which is the main reason why I'm currently speaking to you completely alone from what looks like the Pillsbury Doughboy's ass crack. And the truth is, if we're not very careful, the next pandemic could well be even worse. There are viruses currently circulating in wildlife. They essentially kill 60 to 70 percent of the people they infect. The virus that causes COVID-19 might just be a dress rehearsal for the big one later. This is not by any stretch of the imagination uh, the worst Mother Nature has to offer us. Well, that doesn't sound great. And look, I know this isn't the most important thing there, but what is it with disease experts and predicting upcoming pandemics while on boats? That's a terrible use of a boat. They're supposed to be chill. Read the boat rules. One, the captain's always right. Two, only fish on days that end in Y. And three, no grim tidings of the viral apocalypse. Did you hear that? That's a boat foul, Dr. Bummer. Boat foul! Indeed. And while you would hope that the last year would have been a wake-up call to everyone, those who study pandemics are skeptical that we've learned nearly enough. I think the what I've seen in history of looking at these pathogens over time is that we usually go right back to business as usual. As soon as the thing ends, as soon as we have a drug, as soon as we have a vaccine, as soon as we can kind of get a wise these diseases into marginalized populations, um, we don't really do the fundamental social change that we could do. Exactly. Unfortunately, there is every chance that after all this is over, we'll end up treating the coronavirus like a really bad fart at Thanksgiving. That is, <laughs> waiting patiently for it to dissipate so we can never speak of it again, and collectively pretend that it didn't just kill grandma. <laughs> so given all of that, tonight, let's talk about the next pandemic, specifically where new infectious diseases come from, why they're on the rise, and what we can do to limit them. And let's start with how we got into our current situation. The COVID-19 pandemic is caused by a novel coronavirus called SARS-CoV-2, which originated in animals before jumping to humans. And that is by no means unusual. It's estimated that up to se- That's the key word here, people. Remember that this virus originated in animals. Very, very important. 25% of new or emerging infectious diseases come from animals. They're called zoonotic diseases or zoonoses, not to be confused with zoono. That's the key word right there. COVID-19 is a zoonotic disease. Zoonotic diseases originate in animals, just like H1N1, SARS, MERS, mad cow disease, bird flu, all those things originated in animals which for the record is a very hurtful thing to call a teenager who's already got enough to deal with. And COVID is by no means the only zoonotic disease out there. There are an estimated 1.7 million currently undiscovered viruses in mammals and birds, of which between six and 800,000 could have the ability to infect humans. And lots of animal species are hosts for zoonotic disease. Birds and pigs can harbor influenza, chimpanzees with a bridge of HIV to humans, and turtles can carry salmonella which is something that we all remember from one of the darkest episodes of the Ninja Turtles cartoon. That's right, <laughs> one of their turtle powers seemed to be inadvertently killing April O'Neil. Now, one of the biggest vectors for transmitting viruses is famously bats. They've been linked to Ebola, the deadly Nipah virus, and COVID-19. In fact, here is that eerily prescient expert that you saw earlier, warning of the dangers of a popular bat-based tourist attraction back in 2016. The bats here in this cave are the same bats that carry SARS virus. When they're up there, they urinate and defecate right on top of the tourists that are walking through. And all you've got to do is be that one person to breathe in at the wrong time and suddenly you've been infected with a, with a virus that is not only potentially lethal to people, it could cause a future pandemic. That's horrible. And not just the disease parts, just the very concept of this walking bat toilets being a tourist destination. <laughs> that might be the worst tourist attraction since Disneyland put Johnny Depp animatronics in the parts of the Caribbean rides. Come on, Disney, there's kids here. They're here to watch some jolly nautical rapists and thieves, not a weird sad millionaire doing a B plus Keith Richards. 
Now, there are reasons that bats are such good hosts for disease. They can fly, so they can cover large distances. They've developed special items that don't overreact to infections, which keeps them from falling ill, and they are insanely plentiful. Nearly a quarter of the world's mammal species are bats. And you're thinking, well, that's great. Then there's an easy fix here. Let's simply kill all bats. That's actually not a great idea for multiple reasons. Not only are they crucial elements of our ecosystem, they're also way cuter than they're often given credit for. Just look at this fuzzy <laughs> little goober eating a banana. Look at this one, scarfing down a watermelon. And just look at this little guy trying to absolutely house a single grape. <laughs> look at him go. Who's struggling with a grape? You are. You're struggling with a grape, you little goth mouse. <laughs> also, it is important to remember that the fact that we may have caught COVID from bats isn't so much their fault as it is ours. Because outbreaks of bat viruses don't tend to come from them seeking us out. They usually happen when a human takes a bat somewhere it'll never go on its own or intrudes on its home. And that actually brings us to the first big thing we're doing that may well bring about the next pandemic. And that is in raising the buffer between civilization and wildlife. Scientists have repeatedly warned us about the dangers of deforestation, urbanization, mining, and generally supply. I'd beg to differ right there. Like while habitat destruction really is a big factor with us encroaching into the environments of these animals that we would otherwise not come into contact with, I'd say the number one threat to our survival is the fact that we consume these species. Our, our desire to eat meat is coming at a price and that price is coming to the light right now. There, there's nothing, there's no injustice bigger than the animal agriculture and the, and the fact that we choose to consume these animals. It's why I choose, what I, why, not, not even why I chose to be vegan. I chose to be vegan because just the fact that we don't need to consume animals, there's no need for that. There's plenty of proteins and vitamins and nutrients that are in plants. And the fact that this, these animal meats contain these things, most of those animals that we consume eat plants. Where do they get those nutrients from? From the plants. So you cut out the middleman and consume the plants straight yourself. And you don't have to worry about zoonotic diseases and stuff like that. So I say the number one threat and the number one reason that we are dealing with this and that we may possibly even freaking become extinct if we don't learn from our mistakes is the fact that we are consuming animals. There's no nutrient, again I'll say it, there's no nutrient, vitamins, minerals, amino acids or anything like that that can't be found in plants that only can be found in animals. Animals get all these things from consuming plants. And the carnivores have them because they consume the animals that eat those plants. But, but again, those are secondhand nutrients. Cut out the middleman, eat the plants yourself, and you'll have a way healthier life. Planting natural habitats, which has been far more extensive than you might think. Many people imagine there's this untouched wilderness because they see it on their TV screens. But the reality is, there's really not a lot of wild left out there. We've already lost nearly 90% of the wetlands around the world. We've transformed the forests, our grasslands, We've converted 75% of the land that is not covered by ice. Three quarters of the terrestrial surface has been changed, a lot of it just to feed one species. It's true. We've changed three quarters of the Earth's land areas. And while some of that was necessary, we have also changed a lot to build dumb, pointless shit that no one really wants or needs, like paintball courses or novelty t-shirt shops or some. I'll speak to this. Um about about how how much land we've occupied and taken over a lot of those lands that are occupied are to raise the livestock that we consume it, it's such a backwards uh very like inefficient system for us to to eat 
you know, we, we have these big swaths of land covered by cattle and also the crops that are needed to raise them. So we stop consuming animals. We stop putting ourselves at risk of the next pandemic. We reduce the amount of animals that we breed into existence over a period of time. And while we slowly phase these animals out, and I don't mean make them extinct. I just mean let them naturally breed because people think that these animals are naturally being bred. No, no, no cow is having sex because they want to. Most of these animals are being forced into existence because they, they jack off the bulls, they jack off the pigs, all the males, and then they inseminate the females forcefully. So we stop these practices over time the amount of animals that are bred into existence diminishes and goes into a natural phase the way it should be because the way it's happening nowadays is super unnatural and and not to mention that it is rape to these animals they're being forced you know you're jerking off freaking male animals to freaking put their semen into the vaginas of female animals that's that's sexual exploitation right there all, all to eat a burger and shit it out within the next freaking 20 to 30 freaking minutes lives are being lost and literally flushed down the freaking toilet for a freaking what 10 to 15 minutes of taste pleasure it, it just is in, in, unjustified it's one of the biggest injustices that has occurred and is continually occurring. Like city. And that vanishing boundary has brought increased risk. Over 30% of new and emerging diseases are linked to deforestation and land use change. Take the Amazon. Studies have documented that clearing patches of forest appears to create the ideal habitat along forest edges for the type of mosquito that's the most common transmitter of malaria there. Or take West Africa. The first victim of 2014's Ebola outbreak was a young boy who'd been seen playing near a tree infested with bats before he got sick. He lived in a small village where much of the surrounding forest had been destroyed by foreign mining and timber operations, and evidence suggests that that is what brought the bats into his village. And before you think this is just an overseas problem, it is worth remembering that one of the clearest examples of habitat destruction fueling an emerging disease happened right here in the United States, where Lyme disease was first identified in Connecticut in the 1980s and was driven by suburbanization. What we found is that the probability that a tick is going to acquire an infection when it feeds on a white-footed mouse is about 90%. As we fragment the landscape, we chop up continuous forest into little bits. We lose species, they disappear. One of the last creatures is the white-footed mouse. So as we reduce diversity, we're losing the species that protect us and favoring the ones that make us sick. Right, we fragmented the landscape and that drove out predators, leaving creatures like white-footed mice who are the main culprits when it comes to Lyme disease transmission. And you know what that means? Fuck white-footed mice. They can go fuck themselves, unlike, of course, rats, who can and should go fuck each other. But it's not just us moving closer to animals, it's that more and more we are bringing wild animals into contact with us through the wildlife trade. Now, sometimes that takes the form of exotic pets, whether it's when Paris Hilton got a kinkajou named Baby Love, or this random British man's extremely ill-advised roommate. An ordinary street in Kent and a suburban semi with a normal conservatory, but it's licensed for something far from normal. Is a crocodile a suitable pet to have in a, a suburban house like this? He's certainly mellow. He's got the same animal he would be because he's, he's adjusted, shall we say, to human life. Having something that no one else has got is, is an interesting thing. I mean, sure, I guess that's true. But even if you insist on owning a wild animal, which you really shouldn't, why a crocodile? They're not remotely cuddly. You're basically flooding your broom closet to make room for a carnivorous surfboard. The only acceptable human use for any crocodile or alligator is as the star of the internet's single greatest music video. It's 
excellent. That is excellent. That song is catchier than SARS in a good way. The point here is exotic pet ownership has caused real problems. In 2003, 47 people across six states caught monkeypox, which had never infected humans outside of Africa after having contact with infected prairie dogs purchased as pets. And in 2006, Paris Hilton had to go to the hospital after her kinkajou bit her. And it's hard to say which was worse there, the US monkeypox outbreak or Baby Love's shocking betrayal. Et tu, kinkajou. But perhaps the most famous way wild animals can spread disease to humans is when they're sold for consumption. And the phrase you're probably already thinking of right now is wet mon- Here it goes, people, here it goes. Pay attention. It's like I told you, consumption of our fellow animals is what's gonna freaking do us in if we don't learn our lesson. Markets, like the one in Wuhan, which may well have been the breakout site of COVID-19. And you should know here, the term wet market is used incredibly broadly and often incorrectly. Many wet markets are essentially just places where fresh meat, seafood and produce are sold, not unlike a farmer's market, and they can be key sources of fresh, affordable food around the world, especially in developing areas where there isn't, you know, a Trader Joe's three blocks away. However, some of those markets do sell wildlife like bats and snakes, and conditions in some of those wildlife markets can be ideal for disease transmission. So here in cages right next to each other, we've got uh, adult raccoons next to Capybara, which is in South America, North America, cages right next to each other. This is the biggest rodent in the world. And uh, Tuffy... Why the fuck do you need to eat a capybara? Like, that's what I want to understand. Like, who the fuck in their right mind decides, hey, this fucking animal that's practically a giant rat from the fucking Amazon rainforest... Let's fucking delicious. Let's fucking start importing it and freaking eat this shit. You know, the dumb shit that we do as human beings. Like, I, it's, it's fucking incredible sometimes. Here, I think, uh, I mean, marmosets on top of the capybara. What we just saw here is, it's like a biological warfare lab. Any one animal can transmit a pathogen to another. Somebody buys it, handles it, takes it home as a pet or eats it. Boom, we have another pandemic. Right, when wild animals from different parts of the world are held in close proximity with weakened immune systems due to stress, pathogens can easily jump from one species to another and potentially to humans, which should, at the very least, make you seriously rethink your island in Animal Crossing. You honestly still think it's a good idea to live in close proximity with a raccoon, an owl, a gorilla, a tiger, a sheep, a koala, an octopus, a hamster, a penguin, a rhino, and a chicken named Goose, all of whom traveled there from different parts of the world. That's not an island's paradise. It's a disease Chernobyl waiting to happen. Shut that shit down. And listen, oh, no, it doesn't sound like right genius. whenever someone, particularly with this accent, starts tut-tutting about how people in other countries feed themselves and make a living. And, for what it's worth, before we go tell everyone else what to do, we might want to acknowledge that our track record on mixing animals isn't great either. One expert that we spoke to said a major concern of theirs is state fairs, which does kind of make sense. State and agricultural fairs have been linked to multiple disease outbreaks, with one in 2012 that infected over 300 people, mostly children, across 10 states. That probably explains why fairgoers have been repeatedly warned, no kissing pigs. And look, it's easy to think, come on, I'd never kiss a pig, but are you really sure about that? What about this one? Now you're not so sure, are you? What about this one right here? Now you're even more confused. How about this pig? Exactly, I thought so. Well, I've got great news. This hot little pork chop's been watching you across the bar all night. It's down for some stuff. And America is actually ground zero <laughs> for another dangerous practice here, factory farming. It's something that started here, but has since skyrocketed around the world, to the point that factory farms now supply... There you go, people. Factory farming. Factory farming. It's pretty much going to be what screws us over if we continue to let this happen. It's like I said, no injustice goes unpunished. We've ignored animal suffering. Some people don't even think about the animal suffering, you know, and I don't blame the average person for not knowing because the, the government coupled with the people who profit off of the consumption of animals and the rearing of animals, they 
fight tooth and nail and go beyond extra miles to disconnect us from the fact that these living, breathing, sentient creatures that are able to feel love, pain, joy, excitement, fear, they, they disconnect us as far as possible from these an animals. From from our fellow sentient beings, our fellow earthlings, you know, it's 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 it, it's one of the biggest injustices that is still occurring today. So, they they lobby government, you know, by lining the pockets of certain politicians, you know, donating with their little secret super PACs and shit like that into into politicians' campaigns and stuff like that, you know. They go the extra mile to block uh, vegan products from being uh, from being called certain terminologies that they feel are in conflict and competition with them. You know, there's there's uh, ag gag laws that prevent people from speaking out against the cruelties and sufferings of the animals that are reared in these horrid conditions. You know, being crammed. Thousands in a shed on top of each other, you know, imagine a, imagine you having to share a room with a thousand human beings and, and you know, eventually y'all gonna go crazy on each other, wanna fight each other, some people are gonna freaking die and start rotting on the floor and shit like that, y'all gonna be covered in each other's shit, and these are the things that we're putting animals through in day in and day out for 10 to 15 minutes of taste pleasure. Because that's all that it boils down to. The, our consumption of animals is is an indulgence. It's not it's not a necessity. When when we were alive back in when our because people go, oh, what about our ancestors? That's what they did, you know. Yeah, our ancestors did that, and that's what was ne ne necessary at those times. But it's no longer necessary. We are not our ancestors. We are not fucking cavemen. You know, we're we're supposed to be civilized and, and what we're putting these animals through, you know, whether it's consciously and, and if you're doing it consciously, that's, I find it that's more freaking evil. But if you're if you're one of the millions of people who don't know what's actually going on and you're just you've been strung along because, you know, it's what it's what those in power tell you. That's necessary to be done. It's what our doctors have been taught is necessary to be done. But, you know, things change. And, and we need to change. We need to evolve. And honestly, veganism, I believe, is the path to the future. You know, a lot of people dismiss veganism because they believe, ah, it's a freaking diet. That's the furthest thing from the truth. Veganism, before it is anything else... Is a philosophical ideal that stands against the exploitation and abuse of animals as far as practically possible. Remember that, that's the key word, as far as practically possible. It means, you know, there's some wiggle room in there if you need, if you absolutely need to survive. If you're an indigenous person in the Rainforest, I don't expect you to be able to make it to a freaking Trader Joe's or, or a freaking supermarket. You know, that's that's just impossible. If you're in a, if you freaking crash in the mountains and the only thing you can eat is a freaking mountain goat, hey, you have to do what you gotta do to survive. But us in the city areas and urbanized areas and in developed areas where we have access to supermarkets, where we have access to produce and stuff like that, there's no need for animal consumption. It, it, it's just an indulgence. And, it, and it's something that's catching up to us. You know, one of the biggest killers of human beings next to the zoonotic diseases are freaking diseases that are, are diet-related. Animal consumption causes huge amounts of heart disease, heart problems, diabetes. All these all these things can be avoided if you were on a plant-based diet. Plant-based diet is the diet that is adopted by vegans. Veganism is not a diet. It is a 
philosophical ideal that chooses to stand against the exploitation of animals on all levels. That's through consumption, through the wearing of animals, through the products that we use. We go, we go those extra lengths to make sure that we are avoiding animal suffering as far as practically possible. You know, so pay attention to this next section because this is the eye opener here. By more than 90% of meat globally and 99% of meats domestically. In factory farms, livestock are bred and confined in wakes that can enable viruses to spread among them much more easily. We have several thousand hogs packed in together, and they're all genetically largely the same, and it selects for the most virulent pathogens that are possible. And so in the course of industrializing livestock uh, production, we are also industrializing the pathogens that circulate among them. Exactly. I know it's hard to believe, but the cold mechanized factories that cram animals together before stamping their flesh into plastic meat molds and ejecting the outcome into supermarket freezer sections across the nation might be doing something bad. And when you put all of this together, it does begin to seem like we're actively trying to start pandemics. Which brings us to the obvious question, how do we stop doing that? Well, the most effective way would be to close down all wildlife markets, ban factory farming, stop eating meat altogether, halt deforestation, shut down all state fairs, and definitely take away Paris Hilton's kinkajou. But obviously, none of those are going to happen. For one thing, we know that kinkajou bites. But also, draconian measures are just not going to work here. For instance, if you abolish wildlife markets, that could cause food scarcity and would likely just lead to an explosion in black market trade of wild animals. The reason we know that is, that's reportedly exactly what happened when China attempted just such a ban in 2003 in response to SARS. Which is not to say that we shouldn't try to reduce harmful practices, because we clearly should. Many experts argue for what's called a One Health perspective, where we recognize that the health of humans, animals, and our environment are all interconnected and take that into account when making decisions on everything from environmental regulations to urban planning. And there are going to need to be lots of smaller solutions here too, which will look different everywhere because, crucially, everywhere is different. Take time. So this is another point right there. That's why I say trend we we need to change the system that we have in place because government subsidizes these animal agricultures making the food cheaper if we start slowly switching those subsidies over to plant production we'll be able to slowly start phasing out animal agriculture and as the amount of animals that are bred into existence decrease we should we and and as they decrease the need to use land that is used to feed them because large portions of land are used to grow the crops that feed the animals we already have a bunch of of land that's available to be readily transitioned to growing different types of fruits or we can monocrop it a lot of people are against monocropping for certain reasons which I'm not gonna get into right now but the resources are there they're just being misused you know so as you phase out the animals by letting them naturally just go into breeding instead of forcefully breeding the land that becomes available from their crops and from the reduction of animals can be transitioned into into growing the crops that are necessary to feed everybody. If, if we were just able to use all the crops that are being fed to the animals right now, we could feed the world probably two to three times over. You know, it, it, to me, I find one of the most appalling things is that we're using places like Africa and, and Southern America to grow crops, cutting down rainforests, uh, cutting down grasslands and stuff like that. And in those same countries, there are people who are starving to death. Yet we're ex growing all this food right there. And instead of helping our fellow human beings, we're taking all those crops and we're going to feed them to freaking animals. So then we can eat the animals. 
I find that that's one of the most asinine things that we as human beings do and that we try to justify happening. It, it, it's just beyond, I don't know, I don't understand. It's beyond comprehension for me because it's just so backwards. It, it's something that needs to stop, you know? So, yeah, we'll continue on. They've had some real success in preventing outbreaks there by providing farmers with a phone app to flag any problems that they see. It's similar to go on Instagram without any filters that help the volunteers in the village to submit abnormal health even in real time. You couldn't train everyone to be a health expert, but you can train everyone to be iron eaters. That's very clever. Because with that app, farmers there now have a way to spot a possibly sick bird that could inform broader public policy, which isn't just effective disease prevention, it was also, interestingly, the working title of this show. Now, that scheme has been a success, partly because it preserves people's livelihoods and aligns farmers' interests with those of their larger community. And there will be thousands of small ideas like that that could end up making a real difference. And look, there is no denying all of this is going to cost money, and unfortunately, some scientists doubt our appetite for long-term spending on this. Just listen to this researcher in Brazil make that exact point while taking samples from bats. It's extremely difficult to get funding for our kind of research. Now, during the pandemic, it has been a little easier. But as soon as the virus crisis is over, our financial worries will return. I'm not very optimistic. Yeah, that's not great, is it? Because that that's that yet again comes to the to the subsidies that animal agriculture receive. If if we have all the resources in place, but they're being misused. They're being used to fund these large corporations that are pretty much allowed to rape, pillage, and plunder the freaking land of its resources at our expense at the end of the day, just so that they can live comfortably here and now. But the future that they're setting up for us is going to be like something post-apocalyptic, you know? I wouldn't imagine some freaking huge virus coming, pandemic coming, you know, that's going to wipe us out if we continue going down this path. That's why those resources of the money being invested, our money as taxpayers being invested by the government into these corporations needs to stop. They need to start transitioning into a plant-based system. And, and, and a lot of places are already going that route, you know? But I feel like, like government doesn't just want to automatically cut off all their, all their friends, you know? They want to allow them to well, those who are willing to, to transition, to jump ship, you know, but that's a quickly sinking ship, you know, and there's only a matter of time before the next virus comes out of the system if we, we don't change. People need to realize and wake up that our exploitation of animals is putting us and everyone that we love at risk. And with that, let's just finish up this last bit of the I'm video. I'm not very left. optimistic. Isn't really what you want to hear from someone scraping germs out of a bat. That's a woman who literally knows her shit. So we need to spend however much is necessary to change her answer there. And I'm not saying that this will be cheap. One estimate for the cost of global prevention runs between 22 and $31 billion a year. But bear in mind, even if it was double that, the cost of COVID-19 in the US alone is estimated to be over 16 trillion. So to put it mildly, it's fucking worth it. So yeah, if we can scrape up all those funds, 16 trillion dollars to deal with the pandemic, why can't we do that to transition into a system that's beneficial to everyone? I mean, for God's sakes, we don't freaking even have fucking healthcare and there's other countries that have freaking healthcare for all their citizens. And we're just left over here in the most supposedly developed freaking country in the world who's supposed to be the leader of the free world. And you can't even give your your own people freaking healthcare. 
It's, it's, it's a backwards it's a backwards country it's a broken system and a broken government that we have and we really need to start waking up and stop uh, letting them lead us around with that uh, carrot on the stick or for those of you who are meat eaters that marry on the stick if y'all know what I'm talking about but you know we really we really need to uh, start focusing our attentions off of those TV screens out of those TV shows while they're all fun and stuff like that we we need to start paying attention to what's going on in our society because our own ignorance is only going to get us so far before you know the shit hits the fan and and covid-19 and this pandemic should be a wake up call to everybody all around the world and especially in the United States because we are one of the biggest leaders of agri animal agriculture in this world you know and, and it's insane that we're still dealing with this it's about time that we start transitioning out of this system and we need to consider going plant-based and for those of you who are willing to vegan vegan literally is the way of the future it's the only way to be it's it should be the new norm we should get to a point where meat eating and 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 animal exploitation and abuse in all its forms should be frowned upon and looked upon negatively whether it's in animal agriculture entertainment for personal sport and stuff like that to exploit animals is not a necessary thing we can live a, a good life without having to use animals and exploit them and this is only the beginning if we continue to exploit them and i know right now that might seem obvious the problem is as we come out the other side of this pandemic there is a real danger that we're going to start to get complacent so for the good of future generations and in all likelihood us in a few years time we really need to remember the way we feel right now and invest accordingly. Because the truth is, you never know where the next pandemic is going to come from. Hey y'all, remember me? I'm back! And I'm gonna do what the coronavirus couldn't. I'm gonna kill Tom Hanks! Well, please don't do that, virus! Rita Wilson too! They're gonna call me Oliver's Plague! I really don't want you to be called that. Oh, I think it's got a ring to it. I absolutely don't. The point is, we have got to remember this feeling. It's our only hope. That's our show. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next week. Good night. Oh, 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 John, when I first break out, do you think a bunch of celebrities will make a video of themselves singing Imagine? Probably, to be honest. I've got a surprise for you. What is your surprise? I can spread through Zoom. How, how can you spread through Zoom? Oh. It's full of miracles now. If you'll excuse me, I'm going to Disney World and I'm gonna give everyone bloody diarrhea! I hate you! <laughs> so there you have it, people. This show is very well put together, very well researched. The facts were all laid out for you right there. And and what he said towards the end right there is really what scares me about our future as a, as a civilization. We we become too complacent once we feel that we got something solved and that nothing else can hurt us or happen to us. But it, it happened with H1N1. It happened with uh, with SARS, with MERS, with mad cow disease. All these outbreaks scare us in those moments and then we forget about it and we go back to to life as it usually is and we need to start being more conscious than that we got to stop falling into these cycles of of unconsciousness and it's something that's unfortunately bred into our society and i feel like it's also pushed upon us by those who want to maintain power and control and wealth you know they they profit off of our sickness you know they pro they're literally prophesying profiting off of our sickness right now you know all those vaccines all those medicines that we have to take from shitty diets that we're eating it it it's you know for a for a country who doesn't have a healthcare system our first line of defense is our diet and if you're eating a shitty diet full of fried foods full of animals because animals do 
the consumption of animals does cause us to develop diseases that we would normally not develop if we were just eating a plant-based diet. And and there are people who who are going to fight that and, 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 and resist that to tooth and nail because it's what's been indoctrinated into society. But if we're going to survive as a civilization and we don't want to deal with another lockdown in the future, it needs to stop. And with that, I'll leave you with in these thoughts. You can do research on yourself, on, on what's going on in ag animal agriculture. I highly recommend that you people watch Dominion. It's on YouTube. You can look it up. Type in Dominion documentary and you'll find it. Type in, uh, um, what is it, Earthlings. There's plenty of other documentaries too, like Forks Over Knives, What the Health, uh, Game Changers, Hope What You Eat Matters. These are all documentaries that touch on the reasons why we should not be eating animals. Uh, why we should be, uh, we, why we should ad adopt a plant-based diet. It's important to our health and it's important to our future survival. If you want to leave an earth that's habitable and wonderful for your future generations, for your kids, for your grandchildren, for their sons and daughters, you know, we need to we need to be more mindful of how our day-to-day -day actions and choices affect, and they ripple there's a domino effect that ripples out into into society as a whole into our ecosystems and it affects us we're we're, we're being shown right now this is a wake-up call this pandemic is the biggest wake-up call that we have received to date and if we just ignore it and can feel like just because we developed a vaccine for it that hey that shit is solved these viruses can evolve can adapt and will evolve and will adapt and they eventually will will develop a virus in in animal agriculture if it continues that cannot be fought off with vaccines or antibiotics and then we're pretty much you know f in the a so please please do your research please educate yourself if y'all want, reach out to me. I'll try to help you guys do your research and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, educate yourself because it's knowledge is power. And it's it's about high time that we start waking up out of these little zombie mode coma that we've been in for the longest. So with that, this is Mix with Consciously Metal. Make sure you hit that subscribe button, that notification bell. And I look forward to talking with you guys in the comments and uh, I look forward to you guys responding to my future videos and stuff like that. Be safe. Go vegan.